Fiat 126 was a small four-passenger vehicle meant for city driving. It was introduced in 1972 in Italy as an economic car with its engine placed in the rear. And in the car of the year of 1972 poll, the Fiat 126 took sixth place. Its purpose was to replace the iconic Fiat 500. Even though Fiat 126 was manufactured in Poland with a great sentiment until the year of 2000, its replacement, an awesome Fiat Cinquecento, became available in 1991. Interestingly, Fiat Cinquecento's manufacturing ended in 1998 in favor of its successor, Fiat Seicento, while Fiat 126 manufacturing ended in the year of 2000. So it is one of those rare cases where the predecessor outlived its successor. Throughout 28 years of production, Fiat 126 remained almost unchanged. The example on the left is from 1973 and the example on the right is from the year 2000. Let's take a look at some technical specifications of the Fiat 126. We'll focus on the three engines that were available throughout the production of this car. The specifications listed in the red color are of the model presented in this video, the Fiat 126 ELX from the year of 2000. The specifications listed in the green color are of the two older engines used in Fiat 126P that were manufactured on the large scale and are here only for comparison purposes. There were also a few other variations available and one of the most common one was the Fiat 126P FL manufactured from 1984 until 1994. However, all of the vehicles starting from 1972 until 2000 were virtually the same with only minor restyling changes throughout 28 years of production. Brand new Fiat 126 ELX for the model year of 2000 had the following technical specifications. It had been manufactured from 1994 until 2000. In 1997, a catalytic converter was added and the model name changed from EL to ELX. Prior to the EL trim, the FL trim was manufactured starting from 1984. The ELX was supplied with a 652 cubic centimeter engine that was first introduced in the model year of 1977. This engine developed 24 horsepower at 4500 rpm and had a max of 30 pound-feet of torque at 3000 rpm. All of that juice was produced with two inline cylinders with an air-cooled engine. All versions of Fiat 126P came with a four-gear manual transmission where first gear was unsynchronized. The car could reach about 50 miles per hour in about 14 to 19 seconds. At this speed, the engine would be at the highest gear, which is the fourth gear, and the engine would be at about 3250 RPM. RPM stands for revolutions per minute and it counts how fast a machine operates over a given time. RPM in a car's engine counts how many times a crankshaft made one full rotation and along with it, how many times each piston made a one up and down movement in a cylinder. As for why there are so many variations regarding the time needed to accelerate from 0 to 60 miles per hour or to reach the max speed with Fiat 1 to 6, it's because when the engine of a car is a size of a large lawnmower engine, then a lot of factors could easily shift this time by several seconds in either way. Some of the important factors that could affect this time are the tire pressure, amount of gas in the tank, wind direction, road surface, weight of the driver, extra cargo, ability to shift gears, or even the smallest road inclines or declines. On average, with a nicely maintained Fiat 126 and one driver, it could take about 14 seconds to reach 80 km per hour and to reach a speed of 100 km per hour, which equals to 62 miles per hour, the car could take anywhere from 30 seconds to 44 seconds. 
Factory claim states that when the car is fully loaded, what equates to 320 kilograms or 705 pounds, the car needs 54 seconds to reach that speed. At this speed, the engine works with about 4000 RPM. The max speed is about 113 km per hour. Factory claim states that when the car is fully loaded, it can reach a top speed of 105 km per hour. However, there are records that well-maintained examples with just a single driver can reach over 120 km per hour, which equals to the whooping 75 miles per hour. At about 55 km per hour, which equals to about 34 miles per hour, the car is at its cruising speed at the highest fourth gear and the engine works with about 2200 RPM. The car's carb weight is 600 kilograms or 1320 pounds. The gross vehicle weight rating, which is the maximum allowable weight for this vehicle, is 920 kilograms or 2028 pounds. This means that Fiat 126 had 320 kilograms of total cargo capacity. It could tow a small braked trailer up to 400 kilograms. If the trailer had no brakes, then the maximum towing capacity was 300 kilograms. Fiat 126 ELX was 3,109 millimeters long. It had a width of 1,377 millimeters and it had a height of 1,335 millimeters. The car has a turning radius, which is the minimum distance needed to turn away from a wall in front of the car of 4.3 meters, and it has a turning cycle between curbs of 8.6 meters. The car's trunk is in the front and it can accommodate up to 25 kilograms of cargo so a good sack of potatoes could fit there perfectly. If the car is supplied with a roof rack, then extra 30 kilograms of cargo can be accommodated on the roof. Fiat 126 ELX can burn anywhere from 5.5 liters of gasoline per 100 kilometers on an open road, what equals to about 43 miles per gallon. In the city driving, the car can take about 7.5 liters per 100 kilometers, which is about 31 miles per gallon. These figures heavily depend on driving habits. The fuel tank has 21 liters or 5.5 US gallons capacity. With it, a driver should be able to have a driving range of anywhere from 280 to 380 kilometers or 174 to 236 miles. The front trunk had 55 liters or 1.94 cubic feet capacity. This car did not have a trunk in the rear as it had a rear mounted engine. Fiat 126 Bs is an exception and it had both the front and the rear trunk space as it had no engine. Nah, it had an engine. It was neatly compacted under the rear trunk. The tires are 135 mm wide. The number 80 represents the aspect ratio and is expressed in percentage. It means that the tire's height from the rim to the thread is a number that is 80% of what the tire's width is. Therefore, 80% of 135 is 108, what indicates that the tire's wall is 108 mm tall. R stands for radial tires, what represents a specific kind or tire's construction type, and the number after R is the rim's diameter. The car had hydraulic, dual-circuit drum brakes on the front and back. It also had a drag coefficient of 0.47. Between 1973 and 1975, Fiat 126 was also briefly manufactured in Austria under the name of Steyr Puch Fiat 126 where only 2,069 models were manufactured with the following engine specifications. It had a 643 cubic centimeters boxer engine with two cylinders. The engine was air-cooled. 
it produced 25 horsepower at 4800 rpm and it was capable of outputting 30.4 pound-feet of torque at 3000 rpm. The car weighed 615 kilograms. It had max cargo capacity of 285 kilograms. It could accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in about 37 seconds and it had a max speed of about 116 kilometers per hour. It consumed about 7 liters of gasoline per 100 kilometers in the city, what equals to about 33.6 miles per gallon. We have a quite common cars around here. Modern era car, you would say. Here's another one, Hyundai Santa Fe, a quite common car. Here's another one, some Corolla. You have no idea how easy it is to get in here. You could squeeze this car in most of the parking places just because it's short, it's small. There's nothing better and cool than chilling your elbow on the side of the window on a hot day. Alright, so I refueled the car, let's put the clutch right in, let's start the car, the car is in neutral as it should be and now I'm gonna put the first unsynchronized gear and of course emergency brake on and let's go, lights on right here. There are people who used to drive these cars all over the Euro, so they couldn't complain. Some people drove from Poland to France and across Germany and then somewhere to Ukraine and you name it. Now you can even find certain places such as Chicago and New York. There are some enthusiasts who actually buy these cars and they, they just cherish them because they're fun. accelerate a little faster so you can see how it accelerates right I, I floored it really right now I floored it and it keeps going I don't like flooring it because this is not the kind of car you want to floor but for the purpose of this video I'm doing it so you can see what car has been washed as it should be properly uh, with a uh, deepest level of care it was washed and you can trust me when I say that 
Why would I wash it with such a care? It's because I love this car. Despite the fact that so many hate it and complain about it, and you know, it doesn't go without saying that they don't have a reason because they, as well, they might have a reason to hate this car. It used to break on them, it was slow and uncomfortable, but also it was extremely cheap and available for to everyone. Everybody could buy it, literally. Well, not quite literally. At first, there were still problems with supply and demand. But when that was overcome, everybody could have one of these. Until the time when they stopped making them. Which is the year of 2000. September of 2000. So, at this point, we actually are driving with three people in this car and I think the purpose of this car is very or best expressed or shown when you got two adults and two kids inside here's the engine bay this is what the engine looks like yeah it could use some cleaning this is your gas pump here, your, elf, your air filter, your alternator. Now over there, I was just recently changing the oil and this is where you add this oil. Over here is where you check for it. See, you, I'm gonna attach it because it's really hot in here. But this is the little thing you pull out to check the level of the oil. Mine is perfect right now because I just changed it. And this car does have oil filter but you do not replace it you just clean it it's in there see all you have to do is to remove that cover when you do you clean the cover and what's on the other side of the cover and you may need to replace the seal that's there too but how do you do it yeah see that's a little bit more complicated in order to replace the or to clean the oil filter that should be clean every 30,000 kilometers you have to remove this crash bar
Don't look at this, there's no lake in here. I just put an oil in here and unfortunately the funnel fell out and they all spilled. So the engine is dry and nothing leaks. This is what it looks like underneath. Throughout my ownership of this vehicle, I have gathered up some spare parts from Fiat 126P. Even though some of these parts belong to the earlier model known as FL, I still see value in them and they are worth preserving. From 1972 until 1979, there were 1,352,912 Fiat 126 manufactured in Italy. From 1973 until 2000, there were 3,318,674 Fiat 126 manufactured in Poland under the name of Polski Fiat 126P and from 1973 until 1975, there were 2,069 manufactured in Austria under the name of Steyr Puch Fiat 126. The total world production of Fiat 126 reached 4,673,655 vehicles. In the years of 1975 until 1992, Poland exported 897,316 Fiat 126P. There were also 190,361 of Polski Fiat 126Bs manufactured. Besides the Bs, there were only 507 convertible Polski Fiat 126P Cabrio manufactured between 1991 until 1995, where 80% were exported. On September 22nd of 2000, which was the last year of production of Fiat 126, only 12,400 were manufactured. Let's talk a little bit about the options that the Fiat 126P from the year 2000 offers. And what do we get in here? So the first thing that is showing here is the the little knob that allows you to open or close the window. See, I'm turning it and the window is moving up and down. Now here is where we open the door, obviously. Here you could put a little bit something in there if you want to. And finally, you get your mirror adjust and you adjust them manually. Now the car is so small that with ease, being only 5'7 here, I can adjust this mirror, as you can see. That's how you adjust them in here. So that's mirrors. Of course you got the sun visors. And of course, for a passenger too, almost as if it was some luxury, and look, you actually even get something to grab onto when you go rally and drive crazy. But the passengers on the back don't get that comfort, which is alright, because there is not going to be any crazy driving. And finally, you're in here. So here you have your gas meter, speedometer, you get your odometer, and this one here reads 21,135 kilometers since the year 2000, which is pretty impressive. And here you get a little reminder telling you how much pressure you should have in your wheels. So two bars uh, on the rear and 1.4 on the front. This doesn't really play any other function. And here, of course, you have hidden lights. So if something goes wrong with the engine, then the light will show somewhere here in the bottom. Uh, you will be able to see that. Or when you put the emergency brake. So let's see that. Let me put the ignition on. And see, you see those things here. I put the emergency brake on. 
right in here it's in between the chairs so you put it on it's there or you can take it down and it's gone and your lights are in here now you have two options in here see so when you have it in this position the lights are off when you put it in here then these lights come on the parking light when you put that farther down the road the low beam headlights come on this is the neutral position this is the first push and that's the second push and the next thing that you get in here is emergency light so press it on and this is what happens next here there's nothing in here there were uh, base versions and the more luxurious if that's the word to use in here the better equipped versions that's not the one that's the most affordable and the base version and therefore you don't get anything in here or in here now here you get your fog light so if you want to use them you not only have to press that button but you also have to have your lights on and now you can see your fog light on that's the way to turn it on all right so now that I put the car on reverse and the ignition is on the reverse light also comes on and to make a real Christmas tree out of it I'm gonna add my emergency lights now you see all the lights on all of them even the license plate light when you have your lights on already and you want to switch between the short and long beam all you got to do is to shift it down here on this side shift it up and they're on and also if you press it this way you can just flash all I got to do here for them to come on is to just do this or I can just push it all the way down and now they're on lastly here you got your blinkers left blinker and the right blinker here is how the dashboard backlit looks like at night so that's it when it comes to lights now on the right side of your steering wheel you have your windshield wipers and guess what it is fancy enough that when I press this it will actually sprinkle so let me go all the way down here and I sprinkle so there you go so you turn it off in here you have two positions available let's take a look at the air vent in this standard version the air only sips through the air vent it can kind of let the air pass through but it will not blow it so how does this work so first thing you have to do in order for any air to come through here is to start the engine so I'm gonna engage my clutch the car is in neutral emergency brake I'll put it on for safety and here I'm starting the car and I'm adding a little gas when I started it seems like it it likes it that way so now I can release the clutch because the car is in neutral and take a look if you want the air to pass through here what you have to do is to grab this button with the red arrow and shift it all the way up now that it is up the engine's fan is pushing the air down through here somewhere and this air is now in this position and now what you have to do is pull this button and now that you did the air is now coming out through here if you want more air to come out what you got to do is to press the acceleration which is down there I, I'll press the acceleration and listen up yes the air hot air though hot 
escaped air from the engine's bay somewhere there is being filtered and pushed through here. No, it doesn't smell like gasoline or like engine, it just pushes the air. If you want that air to come on the windshield, you then have to press this button up. And now it doesn't come out of here, but instead comes out this way. And to check it, I'm gonna put my hand here and I'm gonna rev it, rev it a little bit. Yes, and I feel the air coming out. If I will close it in here, now the air doesn't flow. But interestingly, you can also close it in here, right? It's like two steps you have to do in order to have this work. So here, and here, and here, and finally the air comes out of here, but barely any and only hot, right? See that? That's how it used to be half a century ago, my friend. I'm going to turn this off. So here, press this here, and you can put it here or there, it doesn't matter at this point because the air is not coming. Now, this one here, what does this do? Now, if this was the higher trim, then if you pull that out, then you would get the air to be filtered from the outside right through here. But because this is the base version, it does not have this option. So, what does it do? Does it do anything? Yes, it does. If you drive and you have this open, it will let the fresh air from the outside just be put through here. The air will just fall through because the car is moving and the wind is passing and so it gets through here to somewhere and will the fresh air will get through here if you have that open. And take a look. Let me open the trunk which opens right in here. The trunk now opens and where is the trunk? It's at the front. So here it is. And take a look. You see that this is now open. That's the open position of the air vent. Yes, it comes through the trunk somehow here, through here, and then to in, inside of the cabin. Normally, in the version of this car that is not the base, but the more equipped version, there will be a little fan that will push this air automatically for you. If I go back in here, and I press this back on again. Okay, I just close that little door. And now the air cannot pass through. See, it's closed. The gate is now opened. Now it's closed. Open, close, open. That's how you get the fresh air into the car. Now, what is this wire? What is this? Well, it's a radio antenna. That's what it is for if you want there. Let's talk a little bit about the radio. If you want to turn it on, what you got to do is just turn this on and the radio is now on. Oh, there's only one speaker in here and it's here. Okay, this mono speaker will play something, but in this radio, this being very old called Unitra Diora Safari Pinch. Unitra Diora Safari 5, SMP 502. So you can search for radio stations, but it just doesn't catch any. Maybe it requires some service of, sort, of some sort. So to turn it off, just turn it this way and it's off. Now this radio is not just any radio. It came with the car originally. That's what they used to put in the factory. This company here, Unitra Diora doesn't exist anymore. For now, of course, there's a horn in here, so you can press it, and here you are. All right, so there you go. And here's your reverse mirror. Of course, if you close the door, light comes on, but if you need to have it on, just flip the switch on the side, and it is flipped. Or flip it off. And now, if you wonder what this is, this is something that you would want to use in the winter time if the car is having tough time starting because the engine is cold. You then want to pull this all the way up and then it changes uh, the gasoline ratio of the air, gets more gas, starts easier.
all right and of course your emergency brake seat belt fastening now you can let the passengers on the back by pressing this in here and when you do the whole chair goes up like this and then the passenger can come in in here you can put legally two more people and there's a shelf in here you can put some stuff in there yeah there's there's a forced kit in here that's still in here and you have some some stuff in here CPR instructions so you have a first aid kit and some other information on the other side there you go put it back and here that's not part of the car it's been here so I keep it here all right here here are the doormats same thing on the other side another option that you get in here is adjustable headrest the front passenger get one as well as the passengers on the back and of course you have the ability to lock the car from within inside and in the standard way you got your clutch in here your brake in here and your acceleration accelerator in here here's where you change your gears so standard first second third fourth but the reverse you press it all the way down like this and then you put it on the four that's how the reverse comes in and here's where you put the gas turn it this way you kind of move it and finally it comes out in the video it's gonna okay so I pushed it in and I turn it and it's here let's take a look what's in the trunk so if you open this here what's in here so here you have your fuses for example and here are your fuses all right you can put it back on and very important part of, of this car that every car should have is this fire extinguisher Beschnitzer. this is your brake fluid reservoir Pre oh look written in English press for level indicator check and your spare tire of course your headlights and nothing really on the other side so as you can see it's not very spacious but you could put something here a purse a laptop a small suitcase maybe of some sort and your windshield wipers also take a note that there is no rear window defroster so you can't get rid of that ice should that ever gather up on your rear window it's not here that's because this is the base version so stripped out of every conveniences you only have the engine and the car and the very basic I guess I'm gonna call it safety features remember there's not much safety because there's nothing here empty so under all costs avoid any frontal crash with anything Due to complicated political situation in Poland at the time, Fiat 126P was one of only a few affordable options for a regular working class family, which is why it was often used as a family car. Fiat 126 is considered as a car that motorized Polish society. It has been the least expensive car on the market there, had simple mechanics making independent repairs with basic tools passable, and it had good gas mileage. On the other hand, the car was sluggish, very compact, and never had power steering throughout its 28 years of production. Let's focus on the price now. In 1973, when the Fiat 126P was a brand new product, it costed in Poland 69,000 Polish złoty, while average salary there was about 3,500 Polish złoty. This required about 20 monthly gross salaries to buy this car. The car was also available for export and costed $1,100. This means 
that it could have been purchased with an average yearly U.S. gross salary in less than two months, given that the average gross salary in the U.S. in 1973 was $7,580 for an individual. The car was very hard to go buy in Poland at first, and many people waited for even several years before they could get one. First recipients, who posted their payments in 1973, could expect to receive their Fiat 126p in 1977, so four years later, and they could only receive one if their name was drawn out in a lottery. The least lucky ones, whose names were drawn toward the end of the lottery, could wait for another couple of years before the supply caught up with the demand. But those lucky ones, who were able to buy it relatively quickly, were often selling it as slightly used on a second-hand market for nearly double the price. This was possible due to demand being very high. There was a way to skip these several years of wait time to receive a new Fiat 126p. It was through the vouchers that allowed a purchase of the new car without a wait. These vouchers were usually given to directors of various national companies. Well, all companies were nationalized back then in Poland. These directors supposed to select especially productive company workers to whom they feel such vouchers should be handed to. And they had a free will to which subordinates they wished to give them. However, there were times where these directors handed the vouchers to family members or friends instead. In 1976, Fiat 126p was the most affordable car to purchase and maintain in the whole Europe per German magazine Automotor und Sport. In 1979, it would take about 1.4 years of Polish average salary to buy Fiat 126p in Poland. However, in the year of 2000, it would take only about 6 months of average gross Polish salary to buy a brand new Fiat 126. On March 20th of 2000, Fiat 126 ELX, the standard version, costed 11,951 PLN, what at the time equaled to about $2,941. Also in that year, the average yearly salary in the U.S. was about $32,155, which means that it would take just over a month of U.S. gross salary to buy a brand spanking new, right off the showroom's floor Fiat 126 ELX, the standard version. Yep, buying a brand new car with a month's salary. The production of Fiat 126 ended in the year of 2000. But if it was still in production in 2020, and if the inflation was taken under consideration, then in Poland in 2020, it would take about 3 months and 3 weeks of average gross yearly salary to buy it. But in US in 2020, it would take only about 4 weeks of average yearly gross salary to buy it. All of these prices are affected by taxes of the sold items and the taxes deducted from salaries. Therefore, if we take the net salaries under consideration that include these taxes instead of the gross salaries that don't include them, then in Poland in 2020 it would take about 5 months of average net yearly salary to buy a new Fiat 126, while in US in 2020 it would take less than 5 weeks of average net yearly salary to buy a new Fiat 126. Fiat 126 had a few different official names depending on which country it was manufactured or where it was exported. In Italy, it was known as Fiat 126. In Poland, as Fiat 126P or Fiat 126 Maluch in former Yugoslavia as Zastava 126, in Austria as Steyr Puch Fiat 126, and in Australia as FSM Niki. Fiat 126 also earned itself a great deal of unofficial nicknames. In Poland it was called Maluch, which means a toddler. It was also called Kaszlak, which means 
coffer or something that coughs a lot, which is how many people portrayed the sound of the engine when it was started. In Albania, it was called Kikires, what means little rooster. In Croatia, Serbia and Bosnia, it was called Peglica, what translates to little iron. In Slovenia, it was called Bolha, what means a flea. In Hungary, it was called Kishpolski, what means little Polish. And one of the funnier Hungarian names for it was Eger Kamion, what translates to a mouse truck. In Germany, it was called Bambino, what in Italian means a child. In Cuba, it was known as Polakito, what translates to a little Pole or a little Polish man. And in Chile, it was known as Bototo. Fiat 126 earned a status of people's car in Poland as it was very affordable, had low maintenance cost and a good gas mileage. Also, due to its very compact size, even more basic features and basic mechanics, it has earned a nickname of Maluch, what in Polish translates to toddler. Maluch has earned itself a status of an iconic car in Poland as it was present in every aspect of country's development and nearly every family either had this car at some point or at least knew somebody who had one. In 1997 the nickname Maluch became the official name of Fiat 126 in Poland. Fiat 126 has been manufactured in Italy, Poland, former Yugoslavia and Austria. In Poland, Fiat 126 was called Polski Fiat 126P, which translates to Polish Fiat 126P. Throughout its 28 years of production, the car remained nearly the same with minor restyling. In 1977, some upgrades were made to the Fiat 126P where the most significant one was to increase the engine's displacement from 594 cubic centimeters to 652 cubic centimeters. In 1984, the car has received a facelift, which included changing the pretty chromed steel bumpers to plastic ones. The car also received an upgraded dashboard, and this model was named Fiat 126P FL. In 1985, the car received rear reverse light and a fog light mounted to the back bumper. In 1987, the old-school underpowered generator was replaced with an alternator and electronic ignition was added. In 1994, Fiat 126 has received its last minor facelift and its name changed to Fiat 126EL. In 1997, the catalytic converter was added, and in 2000, the production ended after 27 years of production in Poland and 28 years of production worldwide. There was also a version of Fiat 126 called BIS, manufactured from 1987 until 1991. This version featured a new 704cc water-cooled engine designed in Poland. This version also received a hatchback door allowing access to a tiny trunk space on the back. The engine in this model was highly compacted, therefore maintenance and troubleshooting was somewhat troublesome. The original Fiat 126 continued to be manufactured alongside the new design. During the 80s, Fiat 126P was one of the most popular cars in Poland. It was also exported to many countries of Eastern Europe. Fiat 126P was also briefly exported to Australia in the years from 1989 until 1992 under the name of FSM Niki, and it has been Australia's least expensive car. A convertible version of Fiat 126P was developed specifically for the Australian market. 
It was also exported to Cuba, where it was one of the best-selling cars at the time and it was estimated that in the year of 2016 there were still around 10,000 of them registered in Cuba. Throughout the early 80s, 10,000 of Fiat 126P were also exported to China. There were also a several experimental versions of Fiat 126P developed. This includes a cargo version called Bombel, what translates to a bubble. This variation had a fiberglass cargo area. There was also an off-road version with caterpillar tracks, an extended body version called Long, and a wagon version. Besides that, there was also a prototype with a diesel engine that was inspired by the 1980s fuel crisis. One of the more interesting prototypes included a version where the engine was moved from the back to the front and was powering the front wheels instead of the rear wheels. This prototype was 19 centimeters or 7.4 inches longer than the original base model and it provided a significant cargo space increase. However, due to large costs associated with this complicated technical modification, there was only one prototype made and the project was abandoned. 